we have a uh, half an hour for questions for those of you in the overflow rooms we have um, question cards you can pass them to our interns I'm going to begin um, like many of you I remember the Syrians in Lebanon I remember seeing the Syrians leave and of course now you're talking about the reemergence although not physically can you give some examples Paul really of how, um, as you said, foreign policy and military policy is being coordinated by the Syrians. If you could give us some examples of that. Um, well, you take sort of three branches of the Lebanese political scene. Obviously, Hezbollah and some of the allies of Hezbollah in Syria coordinate directly with Syria at all levels and have for a long time. So that's kind of steady. Uh, the m president who was agreed to be elected uh, uh, in uh, you know, the beginning of his term, also had the approval of Syria and has very good relations with Syria. He tries to maintain a reasonable middle ground and middle road, which I think he's doing very well. But part of that is his awareness that he must not, uh, he must somewhat coordinate some of the big issues with Syria and cannot stray far from that line. And in his mind, and I think that's an accurate reading of Lebanon's precariousness, that he has to do that. At the same time, he tries to, you know, also not stray too far from, you know, the Saudi position. He tries to find this middle ground. So he is involved in that as well. The real shift, of course, is in uh, the March 14 movement, obviously Walid Jumblat, who made a very dramatic shift. And then the prime minister, the current prime minister, Saad Hariri, who has tried to deal with this uh, rapprochement with Syria in more formal terms as prime minister visiting the neighboring uh, uh, government and uh, discussing and in some cases coordinating issues and policies. Uh, so, but I mean at the heart of it, my reading is uh, the March 14 movement and to some degree the Saudi reading and maybe some of the reading of the Sunni predicament in Lebanon as well as maybe in other, elsewhere, Iraq and other, and other places. In 2005, 6, and 7, uh, there was an expectation among some that Syria, the regime might go away or it might be dramatically weakened. And, and at the same time, Hezbollah might be dramatically weakened or might go away or, or things of that nature. Uh, when that didn't happen, that tense standoff, which ended in the May events, illustrated that Hezbollah not only isn't going away, but it is in a very dominant position, and that the Sunni community, through its alliance with Saudi Arabia and the U.S. and others, and through perhaps its own attempt at self-defense, cannot, cannot do it, and that, it's, uh, that it cannot defend its interest from Hezbollah. Uh, I think the Saudi read, the reading as to the Sunni predicament in Lebanon and Iraq, which originally included isolating Syria, weakening Syria as a way to strengthen others, realized that to protect and promote the interests of these communities in Lebanon and, as you saw in the recent elections in Iraq, switched to a policy of working or engaging Syria and asking for Syria's help in protecting and preserving and so on. This reminds me to some degree of the situation in the 90s when Saudi-Syrian relations were reasonably good, Prime Minister uh, Rafi al-Hariri, who, who definitely had you know, his issues and problems with Syria, yet they had an understanding that each had his position, each had his role, and it was under a kind of a Syrian umbrella. Uh, so that's the broader context. In effect, I think uh, uh, the current Prime Minister and the movement has found that going out on a limb uh, against Hezbollah or against Syria or against Iran in favor of what was the U.S. hardline position at the time and which was a genuine Lebanese position on Lebanese issues uh, was not bearing fruit. And if anything, it was making that leadership and that community much more vulnerable to attack without any chance of, of getting anywhere. And I think the sense now is it's better to fold under sort of the broader Syrian position, particularly that I think the leadership realized, which is true, which is what I'm saying, that at the end of the day, it really is all about the peace process. And that's not just talk. Uh, and and Saad al-Hariri, who was here and said it clearly here and says it clearly in Lebanon, which, and that's very true, that yes, there's fights between communities in Lebanon and there's that, all that local stuff, 
But at the end of the day, if there isn't progress, if there isn't a peace treaty between Syria and Israel, and then a context for Lebanon to regain normality, uh, the rest is a, wa is a very dangerous waste of time. Uh, so I think by him uh, being closer to the Syrian position and to the Turkish position and the Saudi position, which is these are countries which have committed to a peace process and to a final land for peace deal with Israel, and they feel that Israel is not reciprocating, and they're feeling that that's really where the ball lies. So for, for a Lebanese group to play a game that is not going to get anywhere within that broader context doesn't, doesn't help. That's maybe a long, confusing answer for a small question. Phil Wilcox, please. I'm Phil Wilcox. Okay. Phil, a Phil Wilcox, Foundation for Middle East Peace. Uh, the United States government uh, engages with the government of Lebanon, uh, presumably uh, it conducts uh, business at many levels. Uh, yet uh, a component of the Lebanese government is the Hezbollah, which the U.S. regards as a terrorist uh, entity. Uh, is, does that provide uh, an experience, a kind of uh, template, which the United States might use <coughs> if it chose to uh, encourage uh, Palestinian reunification, uh, whereby uh, Fatah and Hamas would uh, participate together in a unified Palestinian government uh, with international support and recognition. How does it work uh, in Lebanon? And is, would that be a, uh, an example of what might be done in Palestine? Uh, yes, I mean, at, at a certain level, and, and many people have been saying that since 2007, you know, it's not recent. And indeed, the Bush administration, which was more, much more hardline, dealt with the Lebanese government when it had Hezbollah members in it, as does the Obama administration, which is much maybe softer on these issues. Uh, and yes, that would be a way uh, for, given the U.S. Congress and, you know, this classification of terrorist organization, you can't deal directly with it. It was a problem for the U.S. when Hamas won the election outright in 2006 and formed the government. But uh, there were many proposals either to have a technocratic government and have Hamas members in it or have a Fatah-led government with Hamas uh, members in it, a, a sort of a Lebanese model. I think that would have been, that should have been and would have been something that could have been acceptable to the U.S. Uh, I think Israel at the time uh, was much more and remains much more hostile to that approach. But I would certainly go further. I just heard Ryan Crocker making statements that he believes the U.S. should talk directly with Hezbollah uh, uh, and get over the old you know classification of you know calling you names. You know you're a terrorist organization. What exactly does that really mean? You know. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, in a mature, you know, if, you know, U.S. drone kills somebody somewhere, what is that? If Israel does something, what's it? Iran, yes, I mean, states and non-state actors uh, are nasty, often nasty. But to my mind, calling Hezbollah a terrorist organization is just such a, a misunderstanding of what it is. Saying it's a an organization which does a hundred things and also is capable and has in the past and might in the future do things that some people might consider terrorists, yes. But maybe Al-Qaeda is a terrorist organization, but I think it's time somehow to get beyond this very unuseful, that people we don't like or we have political problems with, we'll call them names and then we won't talk to them. But I know and understand in U.S. politics that's, that's hard to, to handle.